Hi, this is Aaron Eisberg, Nog from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Beyond Trek. What's up? This is Dag, the Trivia Master. You are about to hear a mini track sponsored by Beyond Trek Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Beyond Trek Pod. Red alert. Captain, sensors detect elevated neutrinos and a quantum flux. Oh no, it can only be one man. That's right, Captain. I'm back from the Mirror Universe. Mirror Dag, you fiend! What heinous scheme are you plotting this time? I'm here to share my thoughts about your Star Trek episode. That's insane. Every Star Trek podcast does episode reviews. Except I'm going to share everything I hate about them. Oh no. If people listen, they'll hate Star Trek as much as Mirror Dag. He's overriding the transmission. I cannot... Ha 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 ha! Today, I'm going to tell you everything I hate about Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Inner Light. You know, the one where Picard gets probed and watches VR porn on the bridge? Now this episode starts off alright, but it immediately jumps into ludicrous. They've just registered this new probe, and now they're talking about it, and it just sounds dumb. Listen to this exchange between Data, Geordi, and Worf. The probe is composed of parisium and talganite, a ceramic alloy. Not a very sophisticated technology. And not even a second later. Sir, I'm detecting a low-level nucleonic beam coming from the probe. You've got a ceramic doll floating in space that can somehow generate a nucleonic beam. And as the scene unfolds, you realize that this nucleonic beam just completely bypasses the shields of the Enterprise, totally consumes Picard, somehow identifying him as the one guy on the ship it should be targeting, and he's down for the count. This reminds me of that time those teddy bears beat up those robots on that forest moon. Anyway, Picard goes down and wakes up in the loving arms of who he will figure out to be his wife, and he'll figure out his name is And he's had a fever for three days. If I were someone's wife, and my husband just came out of having a fever for three days, instead of telling him not to go outside, which he immediately does, I'd get the doctor. Wouldn't that make sense? He sees some people digging some trees. He runs into his buddy, Batai. Batai tells him where he is. And I can't help but imagine how amazingly sophisticated this programming is. First of all, it's all taking place in Picard's mind, right? So this is like neuro-programming. We're downloading this information directly into your brain as if it was a memory. This isn't the holodeck. He's not actually walking around. This isn't a computer program that he's in. It's a computer program that's in him. This is sensationally sophisticated. Like, the guys he's talking to, these are on par with Moriarty level of interactions. Pretty sophisticated for a society that only has ceramic alloy materials to launch a probe. Hmm. And to top it all off, these programs are very much programmed to not react to anything that has to do with space. Because of course they launch this probe into space. Somebody must have discussed, like, what do we do if people are from space and they talk about space? Well, let's just have the holograms play dumb. That's a novel idea. Uh, does anybody else feel that this planet's name is a riff off of a popular game on which there are settlers? I'd be looking at the camera fiercely if this wasn't an audio track. Also, uh, I'm really digging Picard's veiny musculature here. Uh, obviously, in Starfleet, you can't be the captain if you don't lift. Noticing everyone's efforts here to convince Jean-Luc Picard that his life as a ship's captain isn't real... I feel like this episode should be retitled The Inner Gaslight. At this point in the episode, his entire interactions can be, tell me about the science stuff, to which Aline is like, but what about us? Sad face. Picard, fine, tell me. Uh, anything you can share would be helpful. And Aline's like, let me tell you the story of our people, which, due to good editing, we didn't actually get to listen to all of that. I really have to hand it to the people from Catan for this programming. Not only did they get all of the language that needed to be spoken for Picard to understand it just right, but 
I mean, I guess it makes sense that Picard still gets to look like himself, but if the Catan people were giant birds, would he have fallen into a body of a giant bird and tried to be convinced that his giant bird body was the real body? Very lucky, Picard. Very lucky indeed. Also, you've only been here for like a day and you already have your hollow wife trying to jump your bones, so good luck there. And just what the heck is happening on the bridge during all of these encounters? Picard spends, you know, 40 years getting funky with his wife, Aline, before uh, he wakes up. And in that 25 minutes he's been out, just what kind of mess has been made on the bridge? At least that would have been more exciting than what we actually get to see on the bridge, which is, oh no, it's connected to him, like a tether. Flashback to Picard's little VR world here. And he's checking out the sun. Apparently, he's noticing things about Catan that the regular people aren't noticing. He goes and meets the administrator, gives him some plan for some atmospheric condensers, which I feel are a lot like moisture evaporators. Maybe Catan was called Tatooine a long time ago before it ended up in this galaxy. He talks to Batai for a little bit, and then he's like, I'll make you some stew, some vegetable stew. It's like, where do the vegetables come from? Maybe he's just mocking vegetables. It's really dirt stew, which is mud. They're eating mud. After what's surely the best dirt stew on the planet, Picard and Bataille are hanging out. His wife comes out, kicks Bataille out, and then tells Cayman, hey, you need to put your shoes away. And it makes me wonder, did Picard have a bad habit of just leaving his boots wherever he took them off? Is there actually maid service on the Enterprise that we don't know about? <sighs> no wonder he's single. See, earlier in the day, Aline was really upset that he had been living this whole Jean-Luc Picard thing and it had been five years and when's he gonna get his act together and when are they gonna start a family? And she says this. But never in all the stories you've told me have you mentioned anyone who loved you as I do. That's because he never puts his fucking shoes away. They proceed to talk about how horrible they are to each other, which just makes sense. And then there's this exchange. You never once raised your voice to me. 20 minutes ago. This is not my life. And then Picard cutesy wootsy asks if he can build a baby with Aline. Holographic Aline. Weird. I'm going to go off on a tangent for a second. After baby making, telescoping, fluting, atmosphere condensing, and all the other things he's built for the last however many years he's been on this simulation, how does he go back to just being a captain at the end of the episode? Imagine how terrible the mental health treatment in the 24th century must be. Well, he's got 40 years of memories here, but we need him to be in tip-top shape to pretend to be a 19th century Shakespeare actor in the next episode. Let's just wipe a few million memory engrams and get him back to work. That's like Crusher's imaginary way of doing things. Is there a support group for people who experience these kinds of things? Do Picard, O'Brien, and Tom Paris have a subspace support group to talk about how awesome their virtual lives were compared to their real lives? Back to the episode. Riker and co. try to figure out a way to disconnect Picard and see if it's safe. Meanwhile, in Picard's little VR headspace, he is welcoming his second child. It's been uh, quite a few uh, more years since the last time we were there. And... He says this. I always believed that I didn't need children to complete my life. Now I couldn't imagine life without them. Give yourself about 10 more minutes, Jean-Luc. Data goes ahead and initiates the reverse pulse thing that gets the probe to stop messing with Picard. And in Picard's mind, at his baby shower, he collapses. So, if Jean-Luc is spazzing on the floor of the bridge for 20 seconds, isn't that like... Cue up the cool math montage. Mm, 25 minutes equal to 40 years, give or take. So 20 seconds is six months or so. Just imagine being the neuroprogram version of Aline. It can't tell something's wrong. Just walk in the house. Cayman's still spazzing on the floor. Hope for the best. Go tend to the garden. On the flip side, it's six months of not having to pick up his shoes. On the downside, how do you feed someone who is drooling on the floor for that long? Which begs the question, what if someone got into an accident in this simulation and died? Would they wake up in the real world and no one would give a heck about the probe or Catan? 
These people really put all their marbles in one basket to ace John Luke, unless he was the only one who completed the program. Imagine how traumatized a thousand years of randomly encountered space people might be if they didn't complete the program. We can assume they didn't because Picard was awarded the flute in the end. Back to the episode. They reverse the beam, but then they discover that the system from which the probe came was the victim of a supernova a thousand years ago. Somehow there's still planets, and somehow this ceramic alloy probe survived all of that. Back in his head, Cayman is having a discussion with his daughter Maribor. She's an adult now, and she'd rather be digging in the dirt checking for dead soil samples than falling in love and living life. Cayman, having discovered that whatever is happening to Catan is inevitable and irreversible, urges his daughter to pursue life, vitality, those kinds of things, telling her, Seize the time, Maribor. Live now. Make now always the most precious time. Now will never come again. Interestingly enough, this is the same sentiment he tells Riker at the end of Star Trek Generations. I believe that time is a companion who goes with us on the journey, reminds us to cherish every moment, because they'll never come again. Funnily, that's not a word. In both The Inner Light and Generations, he says these things, but then somehow finds a way to live now again. In Generations, of course, he uses the Nexus to travel back in time to stop Soren. In the Inner Light, he wakes up 25 minutes later, having recovered 40 years of his life that he thought was gone. Later on, we meet Bataille, Cayman's son, and learn that Bataille wants to give up his school to go into music, which is fine. Bataille here is played by Daniel Stewart, who's Patrick Stewart's son, and at the time of the filming had to wear a toupee for the role. It was once said that Gene Roddenberry mentioned that baldness in the 24th century wouldn't matter because nobody would care if you're bald, and I was about to make a comment to that effect, except this isn't the 24th century anymore. This is the 14th century on Catan, which puts it into perspective on the things that are going on on Earth. There's a supernova happening on Catan, and Earth is dealing with the Inquisition. Cayman goes and talks to the administrator through some finagling, discovers there's a, quote, plan in work, uh, which we obviously can hint at the probe. Uh, Bataille comes out, tells Cayman that Mother is dying, they have a conversation, and lo and behold, Picard's uh, little VR porn comes to an end because he didn't get the DLC pack that would have extended Aline's life. In the very next scene, it's probably been 10 or more years, Maribor has a son who's old enough to play with the aging Picard, whose makeup looks a lot like the Sona in Star Trek Insurrection. Supernovas have a weird effect on these people. They're not just aging, they're melting. Maribor and Picard talk about this ointment that Picard has made to protect them from the harsh light of the sun, which is super white, bright light. Maribor and their son go and check out this launching of something where it turns out it's the probe that got Jean-Luc in this mess in the first place. His old buddy Bataille and Aline show up and they're as young as ever, telling him that they hope that he will take their story into the future. The simulation resolves and Jean-Luc Picard wakes up on the bridge trying to catch up to whatever's just happened, surprised to learn it's been 25 minutes since he fell down. He later goes into his quarters where he's just trying to relearn everything. Riker comes to him, telling him that they checked out the probe, it seems to be done, and here's a little box. Inside the box is the flute, and that is the only relic the Katani people thought to put in this probe to preserve their heritage. One flute, and one guy who they have to have hope is important enough to carry this message to other people who might give a darn. The cool thing is that in 25 minutes, Jean-Luc Picard learned how to play a ton of songs on the flute so he could share that cultural message, and maybe even that music was originally his son Bataille's, who went into music shortly before the supernova. 
One thing to consider here is just how incredibly advanced and not advanced this society was. This probe did some amazing things. It rendered a full neural interface completely interactive and responding to Jean-Luc Picard. The counter-argument to that could be maybe Picard was just in the role of a character and had to go along for a pre-programmed ride all the while thinking it was him. If that were the case, he would never have made any references to his starship or things like that, and the characters never would have interacted with him along those lines. It's just really bizarre how advanced so much of this stuff is when we get Geordi's line from the beginning of this episode. Not a very sophisticated technology. I truly suspect that something much more malicious was happening on this planet, involving crazy amounts of technology being developed underground while the people on the surface dehydrated and died. But no one gets to know because all they launched into space was a flute. If you never thought about Trek like this before, you've just been fragged. Join us next time where... Wait, what's that? No! Curse you, Captain J! Curse you! We have successfully isolated and filtered out the frequencies, Captain. Good work, team! We can only hope Mirror Dag hasn't corrupted our mission and our audience will remain. Only time will tell. Fragged is a Beyond Trek production starring Dag, featuring the voice talents of Big J and Murphs33. Sound mixing, production design, and editing by Dag. Follow us on Twitter at Beyond Trek Pod. You think you've seen the end of me, Captain J, but I'll be back. Oh yes, I'll be back. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile.